Now we begin to really get down to business with QLab. The whole point of QLab is to program a series of cues that will play back seamlessly with a live performance or installation. And programming cues in QLab is very fast and intuitive. A cue list follows a very specific logic path, typically triggering the cues from the top to the bottom of the list. Once the cue list has been programmed, the cue operator simply fires go throughout the performance to trigger the current cue, and the cue list automatically sets itself up for the next cue. Programming in QLab is primarily about making sure that the cue list is set up in a way that allows the design content to be consistent in every performance, and that usually requires a bit of problem solving. This tutorial will deal with a few basic programming concepts that should provide solutions for many of the typical problems presented by a live performance. Obviously, there are many more complex problems that will require more advanced programming techniques, but those advanced techniques will be discussed in a separate tutorial. You've already seen a number of programming examples in the previous tutorial cue lists, and I'd recommend that you go back and look closely at some of those examples and examine how they're set up. But for now, let's get you started with some programming of your own. You'll be using the practice cue list for this tutorial to duplicate some of the cues in cue list 1.5. So just switch between the two cue lists as necessary. The files that you'll need to build the cues can be found in the cue lab tutorial assets folder. Let's start off by making sure that the group, audio, and fade cues are the top three cues listed in the toolbox. Once that's done, add a group cue by dragging a group cue from the toolbox into the current cue list. In the inspector, make sure that the group's mode is set to the first option, fire first child and enter into group. Select the group cue, copy it, and then paste it into the current cue list 10 times. We actually only need seven of these 11 group cues, so let's select the last four groups using the standard shift clicking method and delete the groups by using the keyboard shortcut command delete, and just make sure that you use the backspace delete key. Now select the last group cue and add an audio cue to the end of the cue list by using the audio cue keyboard shortcut. Notice that an audio file target is not yet assigned, so the cue appears as a broken cue. No problem, we'll take care of that in a moment. First, let's place this audio cue into the first group cue. Select the audio cue and then drag it up into the first group cue. As you drag the cue across all of the other group cues, you'll see an indicator which tells you where the cue will be placed, either inside or outside of a group. Once you've dropped the audio cue inside the first group cue, copy the audio cue and paste it into that same group. Now let's explore two methods for assigning audio files to audio cues. On the first audio cue, click on the up arrow indicator under the target column of the current cue list. This brings up a window that allows you to navigate to an audio file on your computer. In this case, you'll want to go to the folder labeled Rainstorm Scene that's located in the 1.5 Audio Assets folder. Double click on the MP3 file Rainstorm Ambience Indoors to assign this file to the audio cue. Rename the audio cue Rainstorm Ambience by selecting the cue pressing the Q key to edit the Q name, and then hitting enter. With the Q still selected, press the end key to edit the Q number. Let's number this Q 1501P. Notice that although we're trying to duplicate Q list 1.5, QLab will not let you assign the same Q number to multiple Qs within the same workspace, even if they're in separate Q lists. Now open up a new finder window and navigate to the Rainstorm Scene folder. Drag the doorbell ding dong audio file from the finder window into the QLab workspace and drop it right on top of the second audio cue. Once again, note that there's a visual indicator that will help you know exactly where the file is being placed. Rename this audio cue and number it 1502P. Let's add the next three audio cues directly from the finder, which is probably the easiest and most efficient way to add audio cues to the cue list. Open the finder window again and select the three audio files dog bark off stage, thunderclap, and thunder rumble. You'll have to command click to simultaneously select all three files since they're not located next to one another in the finder window. Now drag and drop the three files into the current cue list after the doorbell audio cue. Three audio cues are created and automatically assigned to the files. Let's move the Thunder Rumble audio cue before the Thunder Clap simply by dragging and dropping the cue where we want it to end up. Rename and number these three audio cues. Now add a fade cue after the Thunder Clap audio cue either by dragging it from the toolbox or by using the keyboard shortcut. We want to use this fade cue to fade out the Rainstorm Ambience, so we need to assign the Rainstorm Ambience audio cue as the fade cue's target. Just drag and drop the Rainstorm Ambience audio cue on top of the fade cue and the target is assigned. Notice that the fade cue is still shown as a broken cue because no changes have been made to the levels of the fade. Go to the Levels Inspector tab for the fade cue and make the master fader active by clicking on it and just keep it at the bottom of the level fader. Also on this inspector tab, check the Stop Target When Done option so that the audio file stops playing when the fade action is complete. 
I'd recommend always stopping audio cues that have been faded out. It keeps the cue playback indicators a bit more clear, and more importantly, it helps to preserve system resources for audible cues. Now go to the Curve Shape and Settings tab, set the fade duration to 20 seconds, and adjust the shape of the fade curve to match the fade curve of Q1506 by clicking and dragging a point along the curve. Finally, rename and renumber the fade cue. Go ahead and select Q1501P, hit the L key to load it into RAM, and then play through the series of cues. Note that each cue requires its own go trigger in order to fire, so I've given each cue its own cue number. In later examples, you'll notice that I only give cue numbers to cues that require triggers from the sound operator, so cue sequences will only have a cue number assigned to their first cue. Let's replace that doorbell with a different sound that might be a bit more appropriate for the mood of the scene. Open a finder window and simply drag the file doorbell single chime on top of cue 1502p to replace the target file for that audio cue. Play the cues again to listen to the result. If you run into difficulty when reassigning targets, you may want to add the Refresh Files button to the toolbar and click it to make sure that QLab knows which file it's using for that cue. So we've discussed adding cues and assigning targets. Now let's take a look at the last four columns in the current cue list window. Pre-wait, action, post-wait, and continue. These columns define the automatic triggering within cue sequences, as well as any relative time differences between the individual cues of a cue sequence, and they're essential to the successful programming of a cue list. Refer to cues 1507 to 1510 in cue list 1.5 for the next few examples. The action column is essentially a duration indicator for the content of the cue. You can change the timing indicators of the pre-wait, action, and post-wait columns to display either time elapsed or time remaining by clicking on the gray icon next to the column title. The continue status of a queue can be one of three states, non-continue, auto-continue, or auto-follow. Non-continue queues function just like the queues that you added earlier. Each queue requires an individual manual go trigger of some sort in order to fire. A queue that has auto-continue mode enabled will immediately pass along any go trigger to the next queue, thus firing both queues simultaneously. Q1507 is an example of a queue sequence in which three individual queues are programmed to fire simultaneously. Cues 1508 and 1509 also use auto continue mode, but with the addition of pre weights and post weights in order to adjust the relative timing of each cue in the cue sequence. A pre wait allows you to enter a specific amount of time that will elapse between the time that the go for the cue is initiated and the time that the action of the cue will begin, while a post wait allows you to specify the time delay between the end of the current cue's action duration time and the go trigger for the next cue. The best way to explain how these functions work together is simply to observe each of them in action. So fire off cues 1507 to 1509. Each cue demonstrates a different combination of these parameters. As you play the cues, make note of the results achieved by each example. Note that in this example, the use of the pre-weights in Q1508 and post-weights in Q1509 end up with the same audible result. When we look at Q1518 in a moment, you'll see why it's handy to have the ability to use either a pre-weight or a post-weight. Go ahead and play Q1510 for a quick demonstration of the autofollow mode. Its function is fairly straightforward. Any cue that has autofollow engaged will automatically trigger a go on the subsequent cue when its action is complete. This is very useful for quickly programming a number of audio files to play one right after the other, as is often the case for pre-show music. A very common programming technique in live theater is to use one cue to replace another at a specific time in the action of the play in such a way that it sounds like one piece of music or one complete sonic occurrence. The simplest example of this is the use of buttons to quickly end a piece of music. Cues 1511 and 1512 provide an example of music that was used during a scene transition. Since the exact timing of the scene transition would change from night to night, the music in cue 1511 goes on much longer than was actually required. Q1512 simply buttons the music when the scene transition is complete, simultaneously playing a short audio file while quickly fading out the previous cue. The end result should sound like a single piece of music that was written to fit exactly into the space of the scene transition. Go ahead and play cues 1511 and 1512 a couple of times and experiment with triggering the button at different times. You'll notice that the transition between the two cues is most transparent when the button is triggered right on the downbeat of a measure. The last two examples, Arab and Honk, provide two more opportunities to examine some programming. The cues contained in Arab are taken from a production of the Arabian Nights, and they'll give you a quick look at how some of the programming concepts we've discussed are actually applied in a production. The final example, Honk, 
demonstrates a slightly more sophisticated approach to programming. Once again, a lot of the basic concepts that we've discussed are applied here, but because of the looping honks, there's a bit more required to make it work. Notice that the use of the 11.65 second post wait after the honk drum's verb is necessary to allow the honk loop to function correctly. Inserting a pre-wait before the first honk would affect each subsequent iteration of the honk loop, which would then cause the loop to be completely out of sync with the drums. This is one example of why it's handy to have the option to use either a pre-wait or a post-wait. One last thing that I'd like to point out about this example is that the programming is simply a means to an end. When I first heard the honks played together, I thought it would be fun to add a little drums to them because there was an odd rhythmic quality to the way they played back. With that goal in mind, I set about trying to figure out how to make it work using the tools available in QLab. This just highlights my basic philosophy that it's the content and the desired outcome that should drive your programming techniques. Imagine what you want to accomplish and then just go through the problem solving process of figuring out how to make it happen. And that's pretty much basic programming in a nutshell.